So here's what we are going to do, and I blame Charles a little bit for this because he raised a question two weeks ago that really stumped me, and it, it, it made me think and process, and so I'm still thinking through this. So this is not like a, an answer to that, but I thought it was worth spending a whole class time on this. Uh, last, or two weeks ago, excuse me, we were in um, Isaiah 62, and um, Isaiah 62, God says, I will appoint watchmen and put them on the wall. And basically, they're, they're not going to rest. These watchmen are going to be, um, they're going to be watching night and day. Okay? So, uh, I talked a little bit about, you know, the need for us to have watchmen. Uh, you need watchmen. And, and the watchmen, by the way, um, they, would, they would be positioned... In, in very strategic places. So they would have watchman towers that were outside of the major cities. And then every so often you would have these towers placed so that one watchman could pass a message to the next watchman and so forth. Um, so this message would eventually get back. And so if you had an enemy line, um, people who were coming in and they were going to infiltrate the city, the message would get there before the people did. Because you would have these watchmen up on these high towers, and they would be able to relay that message and, and basically outrun um, the, the enemy who was coming and approaching the city. Um, so the watchman, the, the watchman on the wall was the final last um, uh, person of, of defense. And the watchman on the wall, their job was incredibly important um, because their message had to get back to the king. Um, and the message had to be correct, and it also had to be interpreted correctly. So, for example, if you have a group of people approaching a city, which happened often, and uh, they, were, they were not threatening, um, they were coming to either check out the city or to strike up a trade deal with the city, which was good for business and, and good for the economy, um, you had all kinds of reasons why people came to the city. If you have an improper interpretation and you say, oh my goodness, people are approaching the city. And that watchman reports that back to the king. And the king says, well, why? And you say, I don't know, but there's a lot of them. And they're approaching, you know, they're approaching pretty swiftly. And uh, my, my best guess is that, um, you know, they're coming to, to pull a surprise attack on the city. But then that king assembles his, his military, attacks that peaceful group. You're going to launch, I mean, a world war, essentially. And so, not only is it important for the watchmen to deliver a message, because they can't just sit there and be like, okay, yeah, people are approaching. Let's just wait and see what happens. That's not a proper response. Uh huh. Yeah, my, my guess is, and I don't really know because I just didn't research this, to be honest. I didn't research it that in depth. But my guess is that um, the messages that were relayed from tower to tower, they had a system where it was very simple. Like either this group is a threat or this group is not a threat. And it, maybe it was hand signals because I doubt that they were shouting. But I know they used trumpets. You know, um, watchmen often would use trumpets and... and um, you know, they would sound, they would sound the alarm. Um, yeah, so, so my best guess is that they had a very simplistic mess. So it wasn't like the, you know, I'm going to give you this big, long message, then, then it morphs into who knows what. Um, I imagine it was very intentionally simple and to the point. Um, but, but the point is that interpretation was vital. Um, because if you interpreted that wrong, in either direction, you're in big trouble. If you interpret um, enemies who are approaching the city and you, and you interpret that as a peaceful group, um, you're done. So, uh, my guess is that they were very trained, very well-trained people and also very intuitive people. Um, the watchmen, and we're going to talk about this too, who selects the watchmen, who were they? And uh, the question was raised, who are the watchmen today? You know, who are the watchmen in the New Testament? And, 
and the point was made that, and I agree with this, we, we tend to make two assumptions. The one assumption is, well, actually three. The first is that we don't really need watchmen because we're a group of Christians and who's going to come in and threaten us, you know? So maybe that's one assumption. The other is uh, that everybody's a watchman. Everybody has a responsibility to keep their eyes open and, and, and to pay attention. And the third is that your, your uh, elders, or dependent on what denomination it is, um, you have one select group of church leaders. that Those are your designated um, watchmen. And I think all of those, uh, after really looking at this and thinking about it, I think all of those are wrong answers. You were going to say something, Mike? Yeah, exactly right. Mm hmm. falsified, uh, perverted, um, or, or that you have um, even, uh, I mean, ultimately, the, the twisting of Scripture turns into to also physical and spiritual abuse. And you have this, this horrible, horrible spiritual abuse in Second Peter chapter, um, chapter 2. And uh, if, you, if you read Second Peter 2, it's one of my favorite um, it's become one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it's just mean and nasty and Peter is not nice. He doesn't have any nice words. And you, you read this, and, and when you read this in the context of what's being preached in most churches today, I've never heard a sermon on Second Peter chapter 2 because it just doesn't fit our pretty picture of this pretty gospel of these pretty Christians who never say anything mean about anybody and, and we always just take the, the higher road. And I'm looking at this and Peter, Peter's calling them dogs. He's calling, like, just, he's, like, he's just ramping it up mid-chapter and chapter two. By this point, like, you're reading it and you start to shake a little bit and you're like, like, <laughs> You're nerved out because Peter's being so forceful. Peter's just getting warmed up. And then he goes on and then he's, he's using all these other metaphors and he's like, you know, they're, they're like these dogs going back to their own vomit. They just don't quit. He's like, they, there's all this nasty stuff and they just keep doing it. Then they lick it up and they do it again. And it's, you know, he's... Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter. Um... Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, part of that's because we're all haters and all that. Yeah. But we have to give the right reasons along with it. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. Most people don't. Yeah. 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 Most people don't. So I, so I have a couple, uh, a few things here. You know, it, it's a lot to cover, but I'm going to try to do this in a way that makes sense. So, first of all, I want to say this. People in antiquity, for the most part, when things were going well, let me, let me emphasize that, when things were going well, um, because a lot of times they were just, Israel got corrupt, uh, a lot of times Christians got corrupt, and, you know, some of the letters that you read and in, in, uh, that Paul wrote, uh, the church was just out of control. The church in Corinth, my goodness, where they messed up. <laughs> so let me emphasize when things were going well. People in antiquity um, were much better at delegating than we are today. So in other words, they would appoint specific people to do specific roles, and they didn't call everybody to do everything. Um, they said, okay, you are responsible for this, 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 and this. You are responsible for this, 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 and this. 
and we see this played out, you know, all throughout Scripture. But um, you know, Acts chapter six, I think, is a prime example. They're trying to rope um, the the evangelists into this food distribution problem, which was a major problem. And their answer was, "What? No. Uh, it would it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of preaching and prayer in order to." wait on tables. Now, appoint seven people to oversee this who are full of what? Wisdom and the Holy Spirit. So this isn't random people. This isn't, just find seven people, for crying out loud, who are good at, you know, who are good at doing this and, and appoint. That wasn't the point. The point was, you select seven people specifically who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom in order to oversee this. Um, Is the exact opposite. Yeah. 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 And we're really, we're just really bad at delegating. And, and I think part of it's just because we're not, we're not used to doing it. Um, part of it's because we've seen a, a system of Christianity rather than uh, Christianity. You know, we've developed these systems where everything is institutionalized. And so we have professional, I mean, we still have it today. We have your professional ministers. Where, where did that come from? You know, sending them, whoops, sending them off to, to seminary. Um, and, you know, we do it in, in the churches of Christ. But, I mean, we do it across all denominations. Um, it's a very Catholic thing that we've adopted, but it's this professionalized um, uh, leader of the congregation. And um, you look at the biblical model, and, and who was out preaching? Well, people who had the gift of doing it. And there was no seminary training. Their training was um, you hook up with, you hook up with a, a, a rabbi, a teacher, and you link up with them. And you see Paul doing it with Timothy. You link up with him and you shadow him everywhere he goes. And you basically you're learning a trade. Um, that was the biblical model. And then we've kind of corrupted that a little bit. And I'm not saying it's a, you know, it's a horrible model, but it's just, it's different. So Ephesians chapter 4. Um, oh... I'll just start in verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, Ephesians chapter 4. Okay. Give me a thumbs up when you're there. Okay. <laughs> I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. I love this. Bearing with one another in love. Is probably the one thing that we as Christians do the worst is tolerate each other, right? Uh, that is verse 2. Uh, verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying, by the way, isn't that so unfair? That God extends grace he dishes that out as he sees fit. There is no equalization of grace where everybody gets this fair shake at grace and, and, and this ability for these gifts. Um, there is no equalization where God just says, okay, you all have this equal measure of grace and you all have this equal measure of these gifts. Um, we don't like those passages because it sounds unfair, right? <laughs> 
Exactly right, which is Paul's point in, in several other passages. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, that's Paul's precise point. Why are you all fighting for the same gift? That's right. So we're the ones who mess this up. We take scripture and we, we mess it up. Um, God designed it this way intentionally. Um, verse 10, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Isn't that interesting? God gives the apostles, God gives the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip, to do what? To equip everybody else. To equip them for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning. By the way, it's not just doctrine. Like I said, it's, I, I deal in the business of human deception, human cunning, um, people who come in intentionally to destroy other people. It's not just bad doctrine. See, I was, I was brought up saying, well, the false teachers, those are people who teach something contrary to Scripture. Uh, partially. But the biggest uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, false prophets, all these people, again, read Second Peter chapter 2. These are people who are coming in to take advantage of the, the new convert to Christianity. And in the name of Jesus, they're, they're slipping into bed with these, these young women. And Peter comes back, and I'm telling you, he, he does not have very nice words. You don't walk away from, you don't read Second Peter chapter 2 and write these scriptures out and put, post them on the wall in your kitchen. <laughs> They're not the happy, happy, feely Bible verses where you're like, you know, we all quote, right, you see Joshua oftentimes, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 2 Peter 2, I don't know of any scripture from 2 Peter 2 that you're going to put on your wall in your house. You will this week. <laughs> your husband's going to be like trembling in the corner. <laughs> um, human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, he uses that word again, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And that's the key. Every part has to be doing its own job in order for the body to function. If my liver stops working right now, if it just quits, or if I just reach in there and pull my liver out, what's going to happen to me? I'm dead, right? Um, if my lungs stop working, right? I'm dead. If my heart stops beating, I'm dead. And so this metaphor is carried over into the church, and I think we just kind of yawn at some of these passages um, because we see partial func uh, functionality, and we're okay with that. But what he's saying is every part is every part is important. Every part is important. And you've got to have all these different parts doing their work together in unity in order for this body to work properly. And by the way, Christ is the head and he's the one he's the one who we extend out of. We're anchored in him and he turns us and steers us and guides us and feeds us and Christ is the head of the church. Okay. So with that said, who appoints the watchman? We have, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read um, a lot of these passages, 
But in Ezekiel 33, the whole chapter is the watchman on the wall. God says to Ezekiel, I am appointing you watchman over Israel. That's right. God is the one who appoints. And he says to Ezekiel, I have called you to be the watchman. Why? It's a good question. Why Ezekiel? That's the most basic answer, most most powerful answer, because God said so. And there's, a, there's a method to his madness. I mean, he didn't just randomly select Ezekiel. And God tells Ezekiel in the very beginning that he's going to condition Ezekiel's heart uh, to where he's going to become so calloused that he's going to be able to, to endure the preaching to a people who don't listen to him. Um, God equipped him for years. He equipped Ezekiel to where he gets to the point. He says, now I've appointed you to be watchmen. You need to watch and keep watch for, for these enemies. That's a good point, too. <clears throat> I don't think Ezekiel was doing anything that he wasn't already doing. And so I think when God appoints him watchman, God just says, okay, Ezekiel, you, you are, I now anoint you to be doing what, what you've already been doing. Um, I will read this scripture, Psalm um, 127. Psalm 127. In verse 1, and I think this is vital too. Um, again, we've got to get our theology right. Um, 127 and verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house. This is this spiritual house. Uh, lots of language, both Old and New Testaments. Uh, this, Peter says, you're like living stones being built into this spiritual house. Um, by the way, Christ is the architect. Uh, Solomon says here, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. In other words, it's God who builds this house up. And if, and if we're the laborers and we're building this thing and we forget that God is the one behind this and God is the one directing this and God is the one orchestrating this and God is the one ordaining this, unless we not only get that, but we live that, you're building this in vain. Unless God is behind it, you can build it up all day long and your labor is in vain. And then he says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. What good is it to be a watchman looking over your city and watching out for, the, for this enemy if God's not behind you? You see, I think we forget that a lot of the times. And we're like, man, I'm going to take charge and I'm going to do this and I'm going to rah, 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 rah. And we're all gung-ho. And God's just looking down and saying, but you've you got to be right with me. And you've got to give me the credit. What happened to Moses and Aaron, right? When they came, the one simple act, one simple act that probably took literally less than a second. You're going to make us bring water from this rock. Pow! They hit the rock. It gushes open. What does God say? You're not entering into the promised land, Moses and Aaron, for that act, for what you just did, you're not entering in, into the promised land. It literally probably took, I mean, I'm, okay, maybe less than three seconds. We'll give him a little, we'll give him a little more on the timer. That's right. So the, the, the point is, God tells them, you guys go, I'm going to bring water from, because the people were complaining, we're thirsty, we're thirsty, we're parched, we're dying. God says, okay, Moses and Aaron, you go. Uh, touch the rock, water's going to come forth. I'm going to bring, God says, I'm going to bring water forth. They come out. Do, do we need to bring water from this rock? What, what, was, what, was, what was the travesty? What did they do wrong? And they took credit. That's right. That's right. 
they performed God's miracle and they themselves made themselves out to be the miraculous person. That's right. And so to the people watching that, oh my goodness. These guys just, they're so powerful that they just touch this rock. Moses and Aaron weren't powerful. And so, giving God the credit, what good is it to be a watchman, to set watchman on the wall, if God's not watching over the city himself? Okay, so there's that passage, and then, um, of course, Isaiah 62, 2, that we read two weeks ago, and that again, God sets um, round the clock. Again, God appoints these metaphorical watchmen. Uh, they're using the metaphor to literal watchmen who are actually on towers. I don't think I don't think Ezekiel was sitting on a tower, you know, like doing Morse code relaying messages back. This is a metaphor, but he's saying you need to be watching out and properly interpreting the messages, and then carrying the message back to my people. Um, what do they do? Well, we've already said they properly interpret and deliver a message when they see action. And that's both good news and bad news. Um, when they see action, they deliver a message and say, there's a threat coming or there's a peacemaker coming. And uh, I think text can, can probably avow for this. Number one, there aren't people typically relaying messages to us. Um, but the important part of this is we don't hear people coming back saying, my goodness, you wouldn't believe what we saw this person over here do, and it's incredible. And this person, I'm telling you, if ever you have a peacemaker in your congregation, it's this person. And here's why. Here's what I saw this person do. Uh, we don't get messages like that, right? Because we haven't trained people to do it. And I think it's just as important for us to hear those, those messages. Otherwise, what happens is you start to see everybody as, as, as a threat. In some form. But you start seeing, you start seeing people because you just hear, you know, it happened to Moses. He's hearing all these problems, 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 and he's just getting weighed down. And eventually his father-in-law comes and he says, what you're doing is not healthy at all. You're wearing yourself out, right? So you're hearing, you're hearing this stuff nonstop, and, and eventually you get so over, overburdened yourself. And this is why I think the, the point's valid, that the shepherds aren't the watchmen. Because they're hearing messages so often that it clouds their ability to be able to interpret correctly, whether this is a peaceful interaction or a threatening interaction. So... Um, who, are, who are they in the New Testament? And then we have these scriptures. Um, we're not going to have time to cover them all, but we'll leave you guys hanging so that next week I think we can pick up on this. Um, again, these are just, these, these are my thoughts and, and kind of my, uh, my research behind it, but we find this metaphor extended not often, not as often as in the Old Testament, but you find it extended into the New Testament. Um, maybe I'll save these scriptures for next week because we're about to close. I will give you guys my... my I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... I don't know if this is a blessing or a curse. Again, it's not well thought out. I'm going to give you the conclusion, my concluding thoughts... So I'm giving you the end of the movie before you've seen the middle. <laughs> Do what? Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. For those who don't want to hear, you can close your ears off. This, <laughs> this, this is my conclusion. Who are they? Who are they in the New Testament? Oh, and... Today, who are the watchmen? Those who are best equipped 
to properly interpret both legitimate threats to the church. I don't mean the institution church. I mean the body of believers. So who are the watchmen? Those who are best equipped to properly interpret both legitimate threats and good news. And that's important. Because somebody who's properly trained uh, or equipped or gifted, at all they can do is interpret threats. They're going to wear you and the church and everybody down because what are they going to be doing? Always. And reporting threats, always. And it's like that annoying, you know those air horns? Oh, I hate those things. That people bring to sports games. That's the annoying person who's walking around your church all the time. Warning, warning. And they're always warning because they feel that's their God-given ability to warn. So it's somebody who's, um, they, they both warn. <laughs> no. They're best, the best equipped people to properly interpret both legitimate threats and good news. And these are people not blinded by their own persecution complex where they see everyone who does not look like them as a threat. So in other words, we've got a lot of things being birthed within our culture where everybody who doesn't think like me, they, they hate Jesus and they're a threat. And so, uh, I, for example, I know somebody who... Um, this person is constantly talking down to other Christians. Uh, and v uh, lots of stuff that's political, but anybody who voted a, sp a certain way, they all hate Jesus, and I just can't find it in my heart to forgive them right now. You see, that's somebody who feels like, for whatever reason, they feel like everybody who doesn't think like them is a threat. That is not who you want as your watchman. Why? Because they're going to interpret everything falsely as a threat and every one falsely as a threat. So if you don't think this way, you're a threat to the church. Um, okay. And finally, those who are completely in tune with God who are skilled and disciplined at listening to God's voice. So these are not people who talk to God. These are people who listen to God. Uh, irregardless of whether it's viewed favorably by others, and by extension, those who are alert, those who are still, and those who speak up, both when they interpret a threat or when they interpret correctly the peacemakers. So they're not just like, oh, there's somebody doing something good, or there's somebody who's a big threat. And then they're like, well, let me pray about this and think. These are people who speak up and they move into action when they interpret something correctly, whether it be a threat or whether it be a non-threat. <laughs> All right, so we can unpack some of that next week.